Hello, my name is Margaret Scutch. I'm from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and I'm going to introduce the first four parts of this module 2.4 incorporating community-based monitoring into national red monitoring. What we're going to talk about is the potential application of community-based monitoring within national programs for red for MRV. Not so much with the little projects but where they community-based monitoring is intended to feed into a whole complete national system. And what we will talk about is the advantages that community-based monitoring offers. I will talk a little bit about how this can be set up. I'm not going to talk to every slide. I'm going to skip over the ones that are, are, are very clear and simple. You can follow those yourself. But we're going to start talking about, first of all, why community-based monitoring or CBM should be part of national monitoring. It's important to stress, first of all, that community monitoring is not obligatory under UNFCC rules for MRV, not at all. But it has been mentioned as a useful option in many of the UNFCC decisions, including the Cancun decision. As slide number six shows, community monitoring could involve a variety of different functions. But what we're primarily talking about is gathering data at base level, gathering field data. And this could be data on carbon stocks and changing carbon stocks, but it also could be data on the reasons why carbon stocks are increasing or decreasing. It could also be on non-carbon benefits of various kinds. And as I will mention a little later, there could be other things that communities would like to monitor. Now, as I'm sure everyone is aware, UNFCC requires countries to develop national forest monitoring systems and these can be at different levels of accuracy. Tier 1 data for assessing emissions is based on continental wide averages. In other words, it's not very accurate for any particular location. Tier 3 data is much, much more specific. It's often at the sub-national level. Now, what community-based monitoring offers is a way of developing even greater accuracy at something you could perhaps call even Tier 3 plus, something that's very local and which is much more accurate for the local conditions. Now, although UNFCC encourages us to involve communities in monitoring, it's quite clear that this can only happen in places where you have communities and where you have communities who are already involved to some extent in some ways in managing forests and moreover where they are interested to participate in RED and see that monitoring is an important part of this. And how you do it depends on many, many things. I mean, you, you might make it a condition for being part of a RED project. You might even, even think about paying communities to monitor. That's entirely uh, up to the local uh, circumstances. When we're talking about community monitoring, though, we're mainly talking about emissions. We're mainly talking about stocks in forests that are forests. It is not very likely that communities will get much involved in activity data. This is because activity data is geographical. It involves changing areas of forests. And the easiest way to look at that is using remote sensing and GIS. And these are skills which are not really common at community level. And it may be a long time before we're able to really train communities to do that kind of level of, of work. But measuring stock in forests is a relatively easy thing to do. It doesn't take much training. And many communities have already started to do it. What we see is that there's four possible ways in which um, in which um, communities can be involved. In this first slide, number 10, page 10, we see that community involvement could help to push a country from tier 1 towards tier 3, at least in the areas where we have communities who are present and willing and able to do this. And this could then be combined with uh, approach 3 for, for, um, for, the, for the activity data. Um, the advantages, of course, are that you get much more accurate measurements, much more accurate estimates, as, as, as I mentioned before. 
Their surveys could be more frequent because communities could be asked to do the analysis every two or three years at relatively low costs in areas which are often very remote. And in addition to these things, I think it's important to see that the monitoring of forests may be of value to communities themselves. It may help them improve their own decision making about how to manage their forests. Many of the communities I work monitor their forests not really for the carbon, but because they have other interests. We'll come to that in a little bit. Um, what it does mean, however, if you involve communities in carbon monitoring for a national system, obviously the protocols that you use for doing the monitoring have to be standardized. They have to be consistent with the way that data is gathered nationally so that they, data can be dovetailed into a, a national system. You can't have one community measuring carbon in one way and another community measuring it in another way because they're just simply not compatible. And if your aim is to strengthen the whole national approach, it does mean that you need to if you like, force communities to use a particular way of measuring carbon. And this can be a disadvantage, of course. Um, it's a dilemma because communities may feel that they don't want to do it in this way, that they want to do it in another way. And this is something that is, uh, it is, it is a challenge. Talking about how to relate the national forest data with, uh, with community-based community monitoring with the national level of data. Most countries don't have very detailed forest inventory data yet. Many of them have essentially tier one or at best tier two data. So let's assume that that's the uh, default position, that that's the position of, of, of many countries. Now, what we see is that community-based monitoring can feed more detailed data in at specific points and specific niches, as this diagram shows on slide 15. Um, community-based monitoring could be used simply to build up, to densify the data at, in the national mo forest monitoring system for particular areas where communities are active. It could also be used where projects are being started, for example, red projects. So communities could be asked to monitor before and after so that you'd get some sense of what change is occurring because of red. Then you have the case number three in the diagram, CBM3, some communities, even though they may be engaged in the national activities, they may also be trying to sell additional carbon privately on the, uh, on the, uh, the voluntary carbon market, in which case they will actually need to measure the carbon in order to generate credits which they can sell themselves. And the final part, the final possibility, which is marked as CBM4 here, is that communities could measure other things. Mentioned here as safeguards, but it could be other kinds of non-carbon benefits of all kinds too. I'm going to skip the next few slides because they're, they're, they're fairly straightforward, I think. And we come to uh, the slide 20. These are some questions that you may think about yourself, or if you're in a classroom situation, you may like to discuss this in groups. The point is that there's no one answer to any of these questions. The answer will depend on the local circumstances. And it's important to think through what are the local circumstances in order to make a good decision about what kind of um, a community monitoring you might want to instigate. The same is true of these questions here on slide 21. Let's move on now to setting up protocols for, for, for community-based monitoring. As I mentioned before, because we need a consistent system, we have to have standard protocols, at least for the carbon part of the measurements. And I think it's important to be clear that there's two fundamentally different ways of measuring carbon, which are approved in the IPCC guidelines, which form the basis for the UN FCC methods. The first one is the stock change method, which is forest inventory. Basically, you go and you measure, you set up plots and you measure them and you come back sometime later and you measure them again and you compare them. And from that comparison, you can see whether there's been an increase or a decrease in the amount of biomass. The other method is what's called the gain loss method. The gain loss method is a method which is entirely statistical. It doesn't depend on fieldwork. It uses secondary data. It uses data that's already been gathered in one form or other. For example, timber management plans. It will look to see 
how much timber has been extracted from a given piece of forest according to the records and we'll calculate from that what the loss in biomass has been. Added to timber you could look at make estimates of how much firewood is being extracted to see also what difference that would make. Of course you'd have to balance this against natural growth rates, it's a little complicated but there are, are, are methods for doing that. Now in general uh, when we're talking about community-based monitoring for red, we tend to be talking about the stock change method, and that's the method that I'm going to be emphasizing in the rest of this, uh, this uh, small module, because in fact it's a very much more accurate way of doing it, and if you're aiming for Tier 3 data, this is really what you should be aiming for. I'm not going to talk in great detail about how to set up a protocol because this has been written up in many, many different manuals. Here on the screen on slide 25, you will see some of the most easily available ones. All of these are written in very clear language. They're written for essentially non-professionals. They are materials that you could use to train communities. Um, uh, to, to, well, you could use it to set up your own protocol and to train communities in how to use it. They all depend on, on setting up a sample of plots, how you set up the plots, how you spread them out through the forest is explained. It explains how you measure the trees themselves using calipers or diameter tapes to take measurements at, at breast height and clinometers to measure tree heights. Um, and of course the idea is you'd repeat this over time. So these are the standard methods, and I'm not, I don't have time in this course to go through those, but those are things that are easily accessible and you can use yourself. Uh, as I said, um, it involves uh, forest inventory. There are, just, just to, to mention, there are other methods besides these methods. Um, a, a method often used in the timber industry itself is to use relescopes, which are little optical instruments which make an estimate of basal area within a forest, and from that you can calculate biomass. It only really works in forests which are pretty much uniform, so it works well in plantations or even aged uh, forests. It doesn't really work in typical mixed forests. Um, also, of course, you can use uh, LiDAR methods uh, if you have the equipment. There are a number of other, other kinds of methods. I would like to mention that I think it's important not only to measure the carbon, or rather the biomass, when you're doing community-based um, monitoring. I think for RED particularly, it's very important to look at the causes of the losses and gains that you're uh, observing. You see that the stock is increasing or de decreasing. But for RED it's important to know why, because what you're trying to do is develop strategies to improve the situation. Here on uh, slide 27 we have a list of the typical reasons why we get losses and gains, and this is something that could easily be added to a standard carbon inventory for forests. In this slide we look at, uh, just briefly, uh, at some questions. I think it's important to discuss or to consider why you would use the stock change method and under what circumstances you might have to use gain and loss method or other methods. This is, uh, it's not that there's a, a right or a wrong on this, but it's something one should discuss, I believe. In discussing it, you need to consider the different variables that you would have to measure, the cost of equipment, the capacities required, and all of those kinds of things. Obviously, some methods are very much more expensive than others. LIDAR is particularly expensive and requires uh, very high levels of technical um, ability, which may not be uh, possible in many cases. We also should consider the fact that all carbon inventories are dealing with statistics, and with, when you deal with statistics, you calculate averages, and when you calc averages, calculate averages, you need to think about confidence intervals and error levels. Now, it's, it's standard practice to use 95% or 90%, or you could say 10%, 5% error levels, but you have to recognize that the selection of your error level will greatly affect the size of your sample. In fact, if you want to uh, remain with only a 5% uh, error level, you will probably need about three times as many sampling plots as if you had a 10% level. So there's a big trade-off here that has to be considered. Moving on a little bit to some of the practicalities of setting up a survey. 
uh, just a few tips from my own experience. In my experience, it's much easier to use circular plots than square ones. They're easier to lay out. People in villages find them easier to lay out. If you have squares, you have to make sure you have an exact right angle in the corners, and that's difficult to do. Uh, also, of course, the size of the plot depends will depend on the type of forest you have. In a low-density forest, you need a bigger plot just so you have more trees to increase your, your, your sample, essentially, within the plot. Um, and... Uh, this table here on slide 33 gives some rules of thumb about what size of uh, plot you would need in order to deal with different kinds of vegetation. Another question is which carbon pools you're going to involve. Now, in many circumstances, above, tree, uh, above ground tree biomass is by far the biggest pool. This is true in most humid tropical forests. Although it's not true in many dry tropical forests, such as Miombo forests um, or Selva Baja in, in, in uh, Latin America. In these dry forests, there's often a great deal of soil, uh, soil carbon present too. The question of whether you're going to include these other pools in your measurements has to be considered carefully. Some of them are so small in general cases, like the litter layer and the deadwood layer, it's often so small, less than 5% of the total carbon in the forest, that it's scarcely worth measuring, given that there are errors in measurement anyway. And if you're going to lose, say, 10% of 5%, it's so little that it doesn't make sense to measure it. Soil carbon is an interesting question, though, because as I said, there are circumstances in which the soil carbon levels are very high. In deciding whether you want to measure this, the important thing is to think, will we be actually be losing soil carbon if the area gets deforested? And in many cases, it doesn't happen. For example, in areas which are subject to shifting cultivation, often the soil carbon actually increases as a result of, of uh, shifting cultivation. It doesn't always decrease. So the decision on which layers, which um, carbon pools to include depends, is really pragmatic. You have to consider, is this a major factor? Will it be changed enormously by activities uh, presented by red? Would it change enormously if the area was deforested? And to make a decision on that basis, whether the pool should be included. Another question is how to record the data. Of course, it's possible to record the data just in a notebook on a piece of paper. But these days, many people are turning towards electronic means of, of uh, recording. Um, there are several reasons for this. One reason is that um, it, uh, it's, it's more efficient in some ways because it doesn't have to be transcribed. And because it doesn't have to be transcribed, you reduce the chances of making an error in transcription. The kind of devices you can use could be a tablet, preferably a rugged tablet that's suitable for taking out into the field and doesn't matter if it gets rained on. But most, most often what could be used is smartphones. Smartphones are very common these days. Lots of people have smartphones and there's plenty of software. There's three or four sets of applications which you can download free, gratis, from the internet to enable you to record tree data of this kind uh, on a smartphone. Uh, of course, the level of skill will determine and the, 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 the presence of such a, the availability of such equipment will determine what you can use. To, uh, the table on uh, slide 36 goes into a little detail on that. So the advantages of using an electronic interface is that you, you save time later. You're probably more accurate because there is less chance of making mistakes. And other advantages are that you can actually indicate the GPS location of every single tree that you measure and also you can tie photographs to your uh, plot measurements. The disadvantages are that you have battery problems very often although you could use solar charges in some cases and the other problem is you can't always pick up the GPS signal if the forest is very dense that can be a problem. Of course you might need some training too. So this is an interesting thing to discuss, to think about. What would be the potential for using smartphones, which is the easiest method in your country? Or perhaps uh, if, you're, if you have a, an NGO, if you're working for an NGO or a department which has uh, suitable tablets. Finally, I want to talk about the frequency of measurements. This is something you have to plan. 
how many measurements you want to take, whether you measure every year, every two years, every three years. There are advantages and disadvantages. Of course, it takes time and communities have to be willing to do it, uh, depending on whether you're paying them or not to, to, to do this. Um, measuring every year has the advantage that they're not likely to forget so quickly. If you do it once every three years, they may have forgotten how to do it, and they may have forgotten where the plots are, although, of course, these plots can be marked using GPS. Um, but it also, I think, the me fre measurement frequency should depend on the the activities that are being undertaken under RED. If you're starting some activity for RED, it would be sensible to measure before you start, and then maybe taking into account when you think some of the impacts should start to be measurable, say perhaps two or three years later. So it makes sense to plan your frequency of measurements on the basis of the RED activities that are taking place. Finally, I want to talk about monitoring non-carbon variables, as I mentioned, the safeguards and other things. Because RED projects can deliver many benefits, as we all know, not only carbon, but also other environmental services such as biodiversity. And, of course, if RED is well managed, there may be other, other environmental uh, benefits to, to, to communities in the form of, of, of increased products from the, from the forest, which could be measured. The question is whether you need a standard protocol for this or not. UNFCC doesn't require it at all, and it isn't really required for the national monitoring system. So this gives you quite a lot of leeway to um, to uh, choose your own uh, your own uh, variables and your own indicators to be used. One thing I would stress, though, that I think it is important to monitor the drivers, to try to think about when measuring the forest what indications are there of the reasons why this forest is being degraded. For example, you could measure, you could have an indicator in your protocol which looks at the coppicing of trees, with how many trees are coppiced, how many multi stemmed trees are you getting here, because that tends to indicate that there's a high level of offtake for, for example, building poles or fence poles or even firewood. You could also measure the density of cow dung droppings in the forest because that would give you an idea of whether the forest is heavily or lightly subjected to to cattle grazing these are indicators which are not standardized these ones don't have to be standardized but they could certainly be added into uh, a community monitoring protocol hello my name is arturo valderas and I contributed to the development of this material while I was doing a postdoc at SIGA UNAM with Margaret Scotch. Right now, I'm doing a two-year research project on the implementation of municipal climate policy at the Center for Climate Change, Economics and Policy at the University of Leeds. This project is sponsored by the Marie Curie Grant Scheme of the European Union. So I will continue the description of this module, focus on the discussion on how the data obtained from community-based monitoring could be used as part of the monitoring systems for RED+. Plus. The integration of local data into national systems, either to MRV or to the National Forest Monitoring System, needs to be a specific decision to be made in the design of the program. It is necessary to define specific protocols to ensure that the information gathered through CBM can be included into national systems. This can help to produce different benefits. For instance, the local information can help to increase the sample size of the existing inventories. And depending on how the country has defined the different strata for forest management and monitoring, local data can help to evaluate the impact of different management practices. It can also help to improve the completeness of the inventory by the inclusion of information of specific carbon reservoirs or by helping to migrate from the use of tier 1 or tier 2 data to tier 2 or tier 3 data. For instance, the following slides present an example of how CBM could improve the data of national systems by defining new practices for foreign man management that could help to reduce the variability of the data in the current stratification system. For instance, in the figure you see in blue an area that we say that is managed by communities and where local data can be gathered. So once the forest inventories and the mapping of this area under improved management has been made, 
an additional line of data could be added to the databases of the national systems. The information of that polygon under improved management will have a higher resolution of level of resolution once the local data has been incorporated. In order to make better use of the data that can be gathered locally, it is very important first that the scale of the maps for the definition of the activity data at national level increases as much as possible. And second, that the area under improved management by local communities, this is the area where data can be gathered locally, includes relatively large polygons. If this is not the case, then the data will still have relatively high levels of uncertainty. In the following slides, we discuss other issues to be considered when incorporating local data into national systems for Red Plus. It's necessary to verify the information provided by communities. This is to prevent conflict of interest. However, if the communities are aware that if they produce accurate data, they will be the first group to benefit from it because they will have better information to improve local management, then it is very unlikely they may modify, make up, or change their information. Moreover, if the data can be monitored and traced down to communities, it may be easier to design transparent schemes for the distribution of benefits. One initial benefit for communities will be the generation of information for local management. In this regard, it is very important to identify the topics of main interest for the communities that could be present to engage into monitoring. For instance, it could be the case that a community is worried about the conservation of a water spring or a well, or they may be concerned because of the presence of an invasive species or pest in their forest. There are different aspects to keep in mind when designing benefit sharing schemes in lo if local monitoring is to be included. If the benefit sharing system is going to be input based, then it will make more sense to pay communities for monitoring and to feed the information into national systems independently of the results of the activities. However, if the system is performance based and the total payment received by the community is based on carbon gains and carbon prices, then the payment should be high enough in order to cover the monitoring costs and also other components of the cost of intervention, such as the opportunity cost and the implementation of additional activities. It is possible that in some areas, communities with active sustainable forest management may be already generating information as part of their normal practices, and thus additional process, the additional process for including this information into national systems might be relatively straightforward. However, in this case, it will be necessary to define under which type of agreements the information will be shared, for instance, whether it will be of public or private information. Another aspect that needs to be considered is the relative cost of CBM. Although there are no national systems for forest monitoring systems now relying extensively or exclusively on community monitoring, it is possible to get an idea of the relative cost of CBM in comparison with professional monitoring brigades. In general, setting up a local community monitoring system will, requ will require higher initial costs in training and equipment but will have lower operational costs in the long term. As pointed out before, there could be cases where communities may be absorbing the cost of monitoring as part of the normal management of or their sustainable practices, which means that if the information could be used in the system, the overall cost of the national monitoring systems could be reduced also. In this slide, it is possible to see a list of the equipment typically used for CBM and the associated costs. The cost uh, to integrate and set up a brigade or a monitoring strategy will depend on the specific parameters and variables to be measured and the effort required in terms of the area to be monitored and the number of brigades to be integrated. We are arriving to the last part of this presentation. So wrapping up, what you have seen in this presentation, uh, in order to include CBM into a national monitoring project or system, there are a few steps that need consideration, which go from the definition of responsibilities and design of the system itself, down to the capacity building, the data gathering, and the reporting and verification of the information. 
The first stage in a project will be that of planning and training. Here the key points are how to make and uh, how to include the local data and how to make it compatible into the national systems, both in terms of activity data and in terms of the emission factors and carbon sequestration and enhancement rates that can be obtained locally. By using CBM at its full potential, it will be possible to include different carbon reservoirs and to increase the scale of analysis and the degree of resolution of, for both sources of information, geographical and carbon data. Once the system has been set up, those data can start to be gathered, registered and reported on the field. After the data has been stored, then it can be processed, analyzed and validated. If the data is going to be also used for local management, it is very important that the members of local communities are able to interpret it in the best way to help them into their day-to-day -day activities. Validated data then can be reported to national systems where it will be integrated into communications and reports, including those reports designed for its verification. There are different challenges that need to be addressed to include CBM into national system. However, if there is a political will and the resources are available, it is possible to include information generated locally to improve national systems. Thanks for listening.